Seriously? Ah! What? Can you see? See what? Ah! This video assumes the foreknowledge of the viewer, that you are aware of the story which concerns the former chief of pre-crime, who becomes hunted when accused of a future murder he has yet to commit. Spielberg's 2002 adaptation of the Philip K. Dick story Minority Report is rife with recurring visual and conceptual motifs, all of which are introduced in the movie's opening sequence. These are Eyes and Vision, Submersion, and Emancipation. He looked familiar. In particular, references to seeing are ubiquitous. I've seen him before. How can you even tell? You know how blind you are without your glasses. In other words, we see what they see. Remember the eyes. <coughs> the eyes of the nation are on us right now. Oh, Miss Van Eyck, I'm afraid she's already smitten. She only has eyes for you. Can we see the precogs? We've got eyes on. Anybody got an ID? Anybody? Negative. 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 All right. Scott, Ramos, take the stand. Everyone else, follow me. Let's go. Throughout the movie, there's a strongly recurring motif of vision and the eyes as a means of acquiring certainty. Agatha, I need to see. I need to see what's going to happen to me. And then we'll go. Retinal scans are the preferred method of identification and relied upon absolutely. They are used for purposes as wide-reaching as targeting an individual for advertisements. Charging subway tolls. And access control at security checkpoints. Look at me. Look at me. Positive for Howard Marks. There is such reliance on this system that the pre-crime officers in pursuit of Anderton give up the chase as soon as the so-called spiders positively identify their target as someone else. We got an ID. It's not him. Standing down. There's also the certainty that comes with visually witnessing a person or event. Precog's visions are accepted as proof that a murder will occur in the absence of intervention, with a certainty comparable to that of the effect of gravity on a falling object. These previsions are in turn witnessed visually by a panel that accepts them as factual evidence. But in the world of Minority Report, a criminal of means will actually swap out his eyes in order to evade identification. Why is he still a John Doe? Why was he never ID'd from the eye scan? On account of those are not his eyes. I'll get eye scanned a dozen times before I get within 10 miles of pre-crime. Sometimes in order to see the light, you have to risk the dark. As a policeman, oh, excuse me, as a former policeman, I'm sure that you know all sorts of people who can help you out in this regard. All I'm trying to tell you is that I'll have to remove your eyes completely. I know. And I have to replace them with new ones. I know that, but I want to keep the old ones. Why? Because my mother gave them to me. <laughs> Look, you don't kill me, my family gets nothing, okay? What about the pictures? They're fake. They gave them to me. The eyes can be tools for information gathering, but they can also distort and mislead the viewer. It's actually kind of a rush. They say you have visions, that your life flashes before your eyes, that all your dreams come true. You're not authorized. How did you get in here?
notice that during their Leo Crow investigation, the pre-crime detectives don't question that there is a man in sunglasses present, looking in from outside the window. As it turns out, this is actually a poster advertisement, a still image and not a person at all. They fail to recognize in this the fallibility of images as sources of certain knowledge. We see the weakness of this reliance again when Anderton distorts his face, and even a former co-worker fails to identify him on sight. Even Anderton's neuroin dealer alludes to his own blindness as an advantage in a world deluded by what they see. In the land of the blind, the one-eyed man. In the end, it is the fact that an image can mislead that is the undoing of pre-crime, as the system is proved fallible when Anderton exposes the case of Anne Lively's murder. Submersion is often equated with murder and death. The first murder of the film includes the submersion of the victim. Anne Lively, of course, is also drowned. And when Leo Crow tells Anderton about the fictitious death of his son Sean, he claims to have drowned him by placing him in a barrel and sinking it in a lake. Anderton is submerged in a pool, testing his ability to hold his breath, when his son is abducted. And this is echoed again when he attempts to hide from the spiders, the cold of the water obscuring their capacity to perceive a living presence. In light of this, the perpetual state of the precogs, half submerged in an emulsion that both sustains them and acts as a conduit for their visions to be digitized, appears to equate their existence with a kind of death, or at least of being non-persons. And this is where the incarceration slash emancipation motif comes into play. One of the first images of the film shows the eyes of Abraham Lincoln being cut out of a paper mask. There's an immediate association to the abolition of slavery and the famous Emancipation Proclamation for audiences to connect with the precogs. Anderton's eye doctor describes his former incarceration as a kind of opportunity for enlightenment and thanks Anderton for the experience which emancipated him from his old way of looking at things. Confinement was a real education, a real... eye-opener. Anderton, too, is freed in a way by his fugitive state, forced to look at things in a totally new perspective, as the hunted accused rather than the detective, and following his transplant, Anderton literally sees with new eyes, and he finally understands what it is that he had missed. How can I not have seen this? And lively. These motifs, so often reinforced, in turn speak to the central theme of the story, and the question of freedom's cost in the risk of uncertainty. Can you see? It's beautiful. Where are we going? Someplace safe. The pre-crime program began in the year 2046 with a federal grant, and now, nine years later, the District of Columbia is the safest city in America. Why? Because pre-crime works. Pre-crime has eliminated the need for conventional detectives. So most of what happens now is the verification and the protection of the future victim. And now pre-crime can work for you. We want to make absolutely certain that every American can bank on the utter infallibility of this system. And to ensure that what keeps us safe will also keep us free. A fundamental question that any society must face is how to balance the freedoms of its citizens against their security. Freedom entails risk, and absolute security is possible only when absolute certainty exists. And this is the function of the precogs. They don't just predict the future, they know it. 
obviously for pre-crime to function, there can't be any suggestion of fallibility. After all, who wants a justice system that instills doubt? It may be reasonable, but it's still doubt. The certainty of their visions makes absolute security possible, and the cost is merely the elimination of risk, and thus the elimination of freedom, at least for the accused. The elephant in the room is the treatment of the precogs themselves, who make the whole system possible. They are essentially enslaved, kept permanently dosed on drugs that keep them docile and only semi-conscious. It's better if you don't think of them as human. The guilt inherent in this is exemplified when we hear the tour guide lie to the children about how the precogs live. But this display should give you some idea of what their daily life is like. The precogs get over 8 million pieces of mail every year. That's more mail than Santa Claus gets. <laughs> Each precog has their own bedroom, television, and weight room. It really is wonderful to be a precog. The precogs are never wrong. But occasionally, they do disagree. What? The precog's submersion draws an association to death, and also with the distortion of truth, as things seen through water appear distorted by the refraction of light. This suggests the crack in the faultless system, that sometimes something seen isn't what it appears. Watch the water. The wind's changed. The ripples are moving the other way. This murder is taking place at two different times. In the end, it is that uncertainty which leads to the dismantling of pre-crime and the emancipation of the precogs. I'm getting you, John. In 2054, the six-year pre-crime experiment was abandoned. All prisoners were unconditionally pardoned and released, although police departments kept watch on many of them for years to come. Agatha and the twins were transferred to an undisclosed location, a place where they could find relief from their gifts, a place where they could live out their lives in peace. Their freedom is a direct product of their fallibility. Do you see?